with that, I will stop sharing my screen and turn things over to Sarah. Welcome to Intentional Aging, Sarah. So happy you're here. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you for having me this morning. Digital literacy is a big topic and how to keep personal information safe online, how to find reliable information sources, and when and where to look online versus when to use other types of sources cannot be completely covered in our time this morning. But we will get started a little bit on all of these topics. And I have um, included resources that will be sent to you um, in Karina's email later next week. Um, if you're interested in a full hour on any single one of these topics that we are about to, um, to cover, just let your organizers know, and I'm sure we could fit that into 2023. Um, I, as Karina said, I'm Sarah. I'm a librarian here at Knowles. And considering some of the topics we'll cover today and the strategies and steps that I will recommend, I wanted to give a more thorough self-introduction than I normally do. I have my master's in library science from Indiana University Bloomington, and I have been working in libraries and public libraries since 2006, and I've been working full-time in public libraries since 2008. I've been at Knowles for eight and a half years, and I am a certified librarian in two states. At Knowles, I lead many staff trainings on topics that overlap with our content today. I also oversee the adult nonfiction reference and archives collections across the entire system. And I'm active on our internal e-resources team, which reviews, selects, promotes, and cancels the paid databases and free online resources that are linked in uh, the library's website. So, um, Sarah, there's been a little problem with your sound. It says it's a little muffled to one of our users, patrons. OK, sorry, let me know, I guess. Um, the Digital Library Task Force of the American Library Association uses this first definition that's shown here uh, for digital literacy, the ability to use information and communication technologies to find, evaluate, create, and communicate information. And this requires both cognitive and technical skills. Digital literacy skills are very similar to other skills and abilities used to discuss finding, accessing, incorporating, and sharing information. Um, two that were, have been in the news the last several years include information and news literacy, which also overlap heavily with each other. Whereas digital literacy includes components related to using the hardware of computers and other technologies, information and news literacy has a more narrow definition, just focus more on the cognitive skills previously referenced, the ability to use critical thinking skills to judge the reliability and credibility of news reports in any format. And so we'll be kind of bouncing between those two definitions today. Together, these literacies contain a set of life skills that enable us to reach, that enable us each to judge the credibility, intentions, and authenticity of a piece of traditional or digital media. This is a really long list of skills obviously, but we're going to cover as much as we can today. Most of the skills and abilities that are included in these definitions are either actively taught or supported by existing library programs, services, and resources. The library provides databases and other resources which contain information from known authors and trusted sources published using traditional platforms and academic platforms. In some cases, Knowles staff review, vet, and recommend a resource, such as a free website. In other cases, Knowles pays a fee for content that is vetted by other professionals. These are our paid databases, like the Gale Database Suite, Consumer Reports Online, and so on. First, we will talk about how you can use a few steps to vet information yourself. Using library provided sources linked through the Knowles online resources page is a great place to start for any question that you have. If you need to wade into re results from a search engine, or if you want to gauge the reliability of a news program, pamphlet, book, mailing you received, literally any piece of media, there are several steps that you can start with. And we will go over 
the steps on evaluating the reliability of resources. The first thing that we're going to always do is consider the source. When you click on a news story or open an email or see something in the paper, find out where it came from. First, we can look at the URL or the web address or the publisher and look for sneaky things here. We will look for intentional misspellings, um, such as um, an email address that looks like it has an M, but what it really has is a lowercase r and n next to each other. You would miss that if you were uh, glancing through quickly. Uh, or it might include a numeral where no numeral belongs. You can also look at the web address ending, such as .edu, .uk, to see if it's a legitimate in site or institution. .edu.co is not a legitimate education institutional website. .edu is. So in general, you want to be familiar with the um, international web addresses, web address conventions, um, such as .uk for websites out of uh, England and Great Britain, .can for websites from Canada. But especially in the last few years, there are dozens of new, they're called domain suffixes, but these new address enders that are available beyond the early ones that we're probably all familiar with, .net, .gov, .com, .org. If you see a quirky, new to you, or brand specific domain suffix like .ninja, .farm, or .institute, these aren't necessarily fake. I just learned about these creating this uh, presentation for today. I had no idea. Um, people who build websites may have chosen one of these new non-traditional fun suffixes to be more memorable or to get the web address that they want, such as the .com version was already in use by another company, so they're using .whatever. Or it may also be based on cost, as some of these domain suffixes cost different amounts to register. And Google lists um, over 300 recognized domain suffixes. It's no longer possible to remember them all, but we now can know that we should go and look to see if it is a legitimate suffix. The other thing that we will do when we're looking at the source is uh, we're going to leave the email or the news story or the online content. We're going to go to a search engine and we're going to search that author, that publisher to see, are they real? Is it a real person? How many articles has this person written before? How many years has this newspaper been in existence? to see um, is this something new or does this um, author or source have a long history of credibility? Sarah, I hate yeah. to interrupt you, but um, as you move your head around, your voice is getting muffled or in and out. So we don't Sorry. know if maybe if you use a headset, it might uh, be more consistent. I do not have a headset, so I'll try to be oh. still. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting when we're considering the source, is looking at or trying to suppose who pays for this website and content. Um, some of that's very obvious, such as there's a new study that claims coffee, wine, tea, bananas is healthy, a miracle food will cure all your problems. Who funded that study and who's publishing it? If the majority of the money for that study came from the banana growers of America, they have a vest, they have like very vested interest in trying to convince you to eat more bananas. If the money came from a government grant for scientific research or from a university, that says something different about what the information is intended, how it's intended to be used. And even more broadly than that, who benefits from you reading or sharing or believing this content? Um, what do they want you to do and how is that going to ripple out? So if you read this and you share it, does it affect your purchasing behavior? Does it affect your voting behavior? Um, what is the eventual outcome of you reading this story and who does that benefit? And we also can look at um, the number, position and type of ads that are included in, um, especially on a website. 
um, I think I have an example. Here we go. So for example, I have a little screen capture here. And we have a news article on the top. And then we have an ad. And it says ad. But if you were just skimming the page, it's set up very like the news article above and below. So you, you have to notice that. Or you might think this is a legitimate news article when really it's just a clickbait ad. Um, so are the ads on a website obviously ads? Are they very clear? Are they put in a different place so that it, it, their intention is obvious? Or are they intermingled in a way that makes them look like legitimate news? That is suspicious to me. We can also look at a publisher or author's history, like I mentioned before. Um, something from an independent publisher, a new press, a website that's just getting started isn't necessarily less credible, but you do have to use some of your other tools instead of just looking at the history. Um, just like a small press will make a name for itself publishing a certain type or quality of story or novel, news outlets will aim for a certain type of reporting. And upon investigation, does this newspaper or website usually stick close to the facts or do they play a little fast and loose? And so that obvious differentiation would be the National Enquirer versus the New York Times. But there's a lot in the middle there that, you know, how, how honest or upfront are they with facts on, you know, a science issue versus a humanitarian issue? You have to look at several articles and fact check them in order to see um, a pattern of behavior. The other thing that we can do is to read beyond the headline. This is something that is really important, especially in um, social media. We see an attention grabbing headline. Maybe we see the first sentence or a little tiny blurb and it, it gets an emotional connection and we share it. But we the headline is not all there is. And so we need to actually look at the whole article before replying or forwarding. So uh, we're especially looking to see if the title or the subject of this email, this article, this whatever is inflammatory or overly emotional, if it is sensational or purposely provocative, if it asks a question that it doesn't answer, or if the title is actually unrelated to the content at all. Does it accur accurately or even slightly relate to the content. Is the article presented as news, but the content is actually more opinion instead of factual or verifiable information? Um, and so these are two examples from a website called Breitbart's. CNN Money put uh, out a list of 10 of Breitbart's most incendiary headlines. And so if this was the title of an article, either of these in the boxes, if you saw that, that might create an emotional reaction in you, which you might immediately share that article without having read it. So now you are passing on information that is sensational and possibly less than completely trustworthy. After we have read the article, we're going to look a little bit more deeply at the specific author. And this, first of all, starts with, is there an author? Um, for example, this top article from 2018 does not have an individual author listed. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, unbelievable or doesn't have any credibility. It just tells you a little bit like, I wonder why that is. And some, some uh, content is done by a team. Some of it is, you know, multiple authors. But just like, if there's not an author listed, that's like a a little bit of a flag for me to look closer at some of these other um, pieces of information. We might look to see if there's an editor or other contributor, and then we would Google or information search those people to see, again, what is their credibility? What is their authority on this topic? There, um, we might be looking for the author's education or experience to find out if the author is credible. And there's different types of credibility that we could be looking for. One is scholarship. Is the person who wrote this uh, article that's on current economic trends, are they an economics professor at a university or are they a dentist? 
an economics professor probably is going to have a little bit more accurate information to say. We might look to see if the art that the uh, author is credible based on their position, such as they are the head of a company, they are in a public or elected office, and the topic is related to their work. And we also could look to see if the author it has special credibility because of their special experience. So um, somebody who participated or was present in a historic event, somebody who was uh, writing a memoir about Occupy Wall Street, who was at Occupy Wall Street and not just in Minnesota watching on TV. Somebody who is writing information about accessibility tools and they have a mobility disorder versus somebody who has a 3D printer. These are different kinds of credibility. Um, we don't necessarily want to discount anonymous sources, although it can be tricky depending on the content of what's being created. Um, anonymous sources may be the only direct line to information in cases of media blackout or when especially government um, employees are forbidden from sharing information. There was the alt parks of a couple of years ago um, when the park department like shut down and people weren't allowed to speak freely to the media, but they were speaking anonymously through social media. That was the only way for information to get out. And so we had, you know, we the public um, had to weigh that anonymous information. There are lots of negatives with allowing anonymous publication, especially of material online. Um, because we don't know who is writing, we don't know their connection to the story. We can't search them. We can't find out their credibility or their work experience. The author who's anonymous may have a special interest. They may have a bias or have um, a goal or like something that they're trying to push through that we wouldn't be able to identify because of their anonymity. They may be being paid for this content. Um, and they are not accountable for any inaccuracies or fallout. They cannot be prosecuted or even called out um, and asked to make corrections. I have a little video that I'll see if we can get it to play. And this is this will be linked on your um, citations and resources page next week out for reports that rely on anonymous sources. These could be people who have little connection to the story or have an interest in influencing coverage, their anonymity making them unaccountable for the information they provide. Finally, and most importantly, try to verify news before spreading it. While social media has enabled the truth to reach us faster, it's also allowed rumors to spread before they can be verified and falsehoods to survive long after they've been refuted. So before you share that unbelievable or outrageous news item, do a web search to find any additional information or context you might have missed. Okay. This is a really great short video that we will watch a little bit of it again in just a moment. Um, so after we've checked the author, the editors, we've checked for their credibility, we will then look at the citations for supporting sources. And so, um, here I have examples you may have noticed on, on my previous slides for quotes that I had, for examples, for screen captures. I had a citation at the bottom of each slide. This is enough information for you to go to the original and see, did I take it out of context? Did I egregiously cut something that changes the meaning? Um, did I quote it accurately? And so from a piece of content, we would work backwards to the most original source that we can find. Um, is the information something that you can access at all? And there are gonna be barriers to that. Um, for example, I have a news story that's farther down in, in the um, slides for an example of um, a scam. And the original report is in Chinese. I can't read it. Um, I, I am having to read an English report on that report. So I'm already one step away 
from the original source material. But in general, you want to work back, you want to use links, and you want to search till you get to the most original content, the original recording, the original paper, get as close as you can, and then look, what's the quote in the original and how is it used? Is it used accurately? Um, and if you cannot access those original reports or content, like I said, we would then want to instead access coverage from across multiple news outlets. And it, this is actually kind of can be kind of tricky because so many of our news sources are owned by parent companies that are all owned by the same company. So you want to make sure that you're getting not just basically the same thing regurgitated by three authors who all work under the same umbrella, but by people who work under different companies and resources. Go back to our video for just a second here. Read coverage in multiple outlets, which employ different reporters and interview different experts. Tuning into various sources and noting the differences lets you put the pieces together for a more complete picture. It's also crucial to separate fact from opinion. Words like think, likely, or probably mean that the outlet is being careful, or worse, taking a guess. And watch out for reports that rely on anonymous sources. Okay, I'll take this back to where we were. After we have checked our supporting sources and gone back in history as far as we can, we're gonna check the date. Um, First of all, is there a date? And um, if there's not, why not? Um, and sometimes, again, it, it may not be malicious or intentional. Um, I had some questions actually when I moved to the county um, because the PDN did not include dates on their website at that time. So it was really hard to um, find the, the correct sequence of events. And it was, it was odd. Um, they do now include those, which is a huge improvement. I don't think that the PDN was doing that maliciously. It's a small town paper. Um, so if there's not a date listed on a story, you know, is, is there a reasonable allowance to make for that? Or um, is, that the, is that common among all their stories? Or is this one maybe being recycled or regurgitated? What's, what, why? Why is that happening? Um, it is especially important for stories that are breaking, that are um, still in the process of emerging, to actually try to disengage and look only, you know, a couple times a day. Not, you know, I know that when big things happen, we're all like glued, waiting for news to to, to happen, um, to be, you know, to be released. But the more chaotic a story the less we need to follow it in real time, because a lot of those news outlets are you know, using um, uh, those emotional connections to try to keep us glued in. And we, we really have to separate that and go, why, why do they want me to feel that way? Who is that benefiting? Also, it's not really healthy for me. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna check once in the morning, I'm gonna check once in the evening, and that way, theoretically, the truth will bubble up a little and I won't be seeing those. We're now hearing reports, and that turns out to not be completely true. Like we will distance ourselves from that a little bit. Um, and checking dates also allows us to see stories that are being brought up again, that were news weeks or years ago. And that is something that that I've seen um, online. And I think that that should prompt the question: Why is this coming up again? Is there a new development? on this and we're just we're referring back to a historical report or is this being brought up to try to stir something up or to try to like what's the point um so making sure that the, the content that we're looking at is current um, i think we've, we've probably all seen things the last um couple of years where people believed parody or satire that was obviously parody or satire. Um, and so things that you, you read that and you go, that can't possibly be true. You know, look, uh, because satire does have an important position 
in social and political commentary. Um, and this quote here that I have, because parody mimics the real thing, it has a unique capacity to critique the real thing. This is actually from a Supreme Court, it's from their blog, but there, there's currently um, an amicus brief, and I'm not a lawyer, so that's what it says, in front of the Supreme Court from the satire site, The Onion. And the, the headline, when I read when I read about it, was like, I can't possibly believe that this this is this is this has got to be satire, right? There was a based on my understanding, there was a person in Ohio who made a satire or, or um, parody Facebook page to make statements about the local police department, and the police arrested him for that, and. So like the, the, the Onion is putting this in front of the Supreme Court to argue about the role of parody in making commentary and bringing up um, problems in front of the public. Um, and so like, what is the role of that? And it goes back a long way, right? The, the satire um, and its ability to point out problems among the elite or the ruling class, especially. So if you see something and you're like, God, that sounds, that sounds like a, a bad joke. Well, it probably is. Um, but what is it pointing out? And how is it doing that better than some other news source that's not using parody? We will, um, as we're wrapping up, um, looking at all of these uh, ways to evalu evaluate reliability, we will consider bias. We, we have bias, and the news reporter or content creator or author has bias. And um, some of these may be easy to spot, and some of them are going to be difficult. So bias, I think we're probably all familiar with by now, I hope, um, that is just the inclination or outlook of a person or their perspective. And it's not necessarily bad. You have your life experiences, which kind of shift the lens through which you view the world. So um, you you, you have that experience, that's your life. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Media bias is the perceived bias or possible bias among journalists or reporters um, because they are also individual people. So this has effects like a reporter who's doing um, any kind of story, because of their bias, they might unconsciously research one side of the story in more depth or detail, or might present it um, in a better light. And so if something in um, a piece of content seems out of balance like that, we would wanna look for what is that other side? Why, why is this happening? Why has this been presented in this way? Um, bias from the researcher, the reporter, the reader, all the way through is a spectrum from unconscious to conscious, to conscious. Um, I'm sure, I hope, most of us do it accidentally, but people can do it pers like purposefully um, or just thoughtlessly. Each layer between you and the original source adds a layer of bias. So when we talked earlier about you know, going back as far as you can to get as close as possible to the original, that is, first of all, removing um, the possibility that things were misquoted or like legitimate actual errors but it also is removing layers of bias. So you're getting as close as possible to um, the original to remove all those like additional filters that are coloring the story for you. We uh, expect that our news should be unbiased and a reporting of facts. This is not actually what happens all the time. So being aware that that is present is really a great first step. An article should discuss um, current trends or a recent event that's of general interest or related to a specific topic. We want it to be factual and report on all sides, but that's not necessarily what happens. Um, and then finally, we're going to ask the experts on any topic um, that, that we're not sure about. We um, have a lot of resources linked on the library's online resources page. Um, from newspapers to magazines and different websites, um, government websites and like um, medical websites. 
So you can use those, you can use multiple of them ideally to find and get, make sure you're getting coverage um, on any issue that you are researching. All of these tips, they were very like, they are frequently talked about in terms of news, sharing things on Facebook, watching news on a website, but they do also apply to really any other type of media. Um, maybe you found a book and you're like, well, this book seems really one-sided. We would use these same steps. We would research the author. We would see their credibility. We would find their education experience. We would look at the publisher. How many books has this publisher published? Five, not a great history. We need to look at something else. You can apply all of these things to um, a pamphlet that somebody shoved inside your mailbox or a hanger on your, um, your front door. What, who put this here? Who paid for it? Who printed it? Why is it here today? What, what are the other options that are available on this? You can really apply it to every kind of traditional or modern media. Um, and I think we will see that a little bit as we get into some of the scams um, that we will just talk about real briefly. Um, I'm sure everybody is familiar now with phishing scams. Um, and we're going to talk about these and we're going to use uh, some of the tools and we have some examples at the end. We're going to use those tools that we talked about to evaluate emails and other um, communications to make sure that we're keeping our information or private information safe online. So for example, we have phishing. These are generally emails or text messages sent by bad actors to trick you into giving them your personal or financial information. Um, we, in general, we're not gonna open things or click on things or download things from people we don't know or that we're not expecting. So for example, if you don't have a Wells Fargo checking account, don't open an email with the subject line that says, your Wells Fargo checking account has been breached. You don't have one, it can't be breached. Like <laughs> that's, that seems like an obvious step. Um, if you open an email that is, um, looks like it's from a family a member or a friend, read the email before you click on any of the links or download the attachment. Does the email message sound like how your friend normally writes? We're gonna look for things like an unusual number of typos, odd grammar that is not consistent with this person. If the email doesn't sound like your friend, call them or send them, you know, don't, don't reply. Use a different method to contact them, to ask them, did you, did you mean to send me this? What's going on? Just wanna make sure it's safe. And I've actually um, accidentally opened things in email that were um, not from people, uh, not from legitimate people. Um, there was an email that looked like it was from a librarian at another library who I, who I knew, I knew that person. And I was in the morning and I was trying to get through my emails really fast. And I, I opened the email, it's from this person. And there's a link that says, please look at this. And I clicked it and I was like, oh my gosh, this is not, this, this librarian would never have sent me this site. It, her email had been scammed, like spoofed, right? It looked like it was from that librarian, but it was not. Um, and so I immediately shut it down. I put everything into like this filter program that we have at the library. I called IT. I said, I, I accidentally did this. I was in a hurry, right? We all use shortcuts to get through the day. And I went, you know, email. I know this person. She says there's a link. I'm going to open the link. I didn't read the whole email where there were typos and weird grammar before I went, oh my gosh, this is actually not a real person. So like, it, it's going to happen. Um, we, we do the best we can. That's okay. We're going to use some of the, um, the same tricks from earlier. For example, we're going to look at the URL ending um, of the email address. And this is actually, um, this Apple um, one here is one that I got last week. Um, I got the email. It says your Apple ID has been locked. I, I'm, I have an Apple account. I know I hadn't been trying to log into it and like making it the number, the, however many mistakes you can make before it's locked. I wasn't sure if maybe somebody elsewhere was trying to use my account. But the first thing I did was I um, expanded where it says from Apple and it gave me their full email address, which you can see in the, in the box on the right. That's not an Apple email address. 
this is a scam. I reported it to Apple and I deleted it. Um, so like it, it is really like they're trying to make you feel panicked so that you'll click on that link and put your information in because you think there's like a very time sensitive like issue here. It's not like take take a step back, look at the to, look at the from, where's it coming from? You know, and anything coming from Apple should be coming from at apple.com. It's not going to be coming from this deluxe fit, which maybe that's a cool new abbreviate like uh domain name, but not one that I knew. So I we're not gonna believe that. We can um, report scams that are uh, masquerading as business emails to the businesses. I emailed this to Apple. I've emailed previous scams to Amazon, to your bank. You can report things to the sheriff. You can report things to the Federal Trade Commission, depending on the topic. So letting other people in authority know that this is a problem, um, that, that helps. That helps these like large um, organizations see patterns of behavior. There are a number of other types of scams that all have their own little names, um, imposter scams, romance or online dating scams, grandkid scams, healthcare scams, charity fraud. All the rules that we've learned apply to these. The first rule to avoiding scams is take your time. These types of scams are designed to make you feel panicked. So we're gonna stop, think, research, call, and then report. So for example, um, the grandkid scams are, you have a, you know, a grandkid, a great niece, a family member, like a, a godchild or something, and you get a phone call that says, grandma, I need $1,500, I'm in jail in Mexico. You know, and your immediate reaction as a family member is I don't want that to be you know, what my family member is experiencing, I'm gonna wire the money. Did it sound like your grandkid? Is it reasonable that like you, your grandkid would go to Mexico and you wouldn't know? You know, call the mom, call your child, call the, you know, call the parent. Where's the kid? Um, you know, we're not going to do anything in that moment. We're going to make sure that this is a real, not, we're going to make sure it's not a real legitimate thing that's happening. Um, and this on the bottom screen example here, um, this is the one I was referring to earlier. The original report is in Chinese and I couldn't get close to it, but this is from Newsweek. I'm, I'm going to, believe Newsweek, maybe, um, a woman um, was in, she was victim of an online dating scam. She was messaging back and forth with someone who claimed to be an astronaut on the International Space Station and said that he wasn't being allowed back to Earth because he couldn't pay the taxes for landing fees. And she gave him an absolutely very generous amount of money to get him back from the International Space Station. Um, which I don't wanna make fun of her for that because you know we all don't know all the pieces that go behind like any, any public thing, right? Um, before you have worked in, in an industry, you don't know what it's like in the stock room at the grocery you know, or at the library. You don't know all the things that go on in the background. I don't know what goes on in the background of getting people back from the International Space Station. I don't think they need to pay taxes to get back to Earth. That doesn't seem fair. Um, but the, the woman had developed what she thought was a real relationship and she believed him, which is unfortunate. Um, so that, that's a romance scam. Um, I have had uh, patrons, not at this library, but I have had patrons uh, try to develop online relationships with prospective um, spouses that were looking to come to America. And when they give them the money for the plane ticket, that romance evaporates and they're never heard from again. And they, they don't come to America to marry you. Um, that is a thing that still still works. Um, I, don't, I don't know why. We're also gonna be careful of malware and ransomware. Um, these are softwares designed to do damage um, or un other unwanted actions to your computer or smartphone. But malware is just short for malicious software and includes a number of other programs, including ransomware, viruses, spyware, key loggers, and other software that is put onto your computer. Um, we're gonna avoid malware uh, by um, not opening unexpected attachments. Um, we're not gonna pirate movies, you know, in general, <laughs> um, but that, that is a, a threat. 
Um, we're not going to open these phishing emails. Um, we're not going to click on really spammy looking ads with like really poor quality um, graphics. The best thing to do to avoid malware and ransomware is to back up your files. And we'll watch a short video here in just a second. Um, it wasn't my fault, but my family computer did get ransomware several years ago. And because we were not good about backing up our files, we lost everything on the computer, like photos from my kid's fourth birthday party and all kinds of like documents that we had created over the years, everything was gone. Um, because even if you pay the ransom, you're not gonna get that back. Um, that, it's not like legitimate, it's just a scam. They don't care about retrieving your files for you. Um, and there've actually been a number of ransomware attacks in the library world recently. Um, Whatcom County Library System um, had ransomware and uh, earlier this summer, took them a while to clear that up. And Baker and Taylor, which is a library book vendor, we buy most of our books from them. They were shut down for over a week with a ransomware attack. No library was able to purchase books from them during that entire time. So like it's, you know, it's still happening. Um, and, like I don't understand why. I think that that's a difficult thing when we're talking about avoiding scams and phishing and viruses. It's like I would never send a virus to somebody. So it's hard to get into the mind of someone who would, someone who's like who has a motivation to do that. Um, and think when we can't understand the motivations of some of these actions, it's harder to to like predict because yeah, it's not something that we we would ever think of doing. If my video works. Your life is on your computer, from your financial records and contacts to your family photos and videos, your favorite music, movies, games, and other documents you wouldn't want to lose. The reality is, if you don't back up those files, you risk a total loss if your computer gets hacked, crashes, or downloads a virus. That's right, everything. Gone in a nanosecond. Did somebody say, ba -ba 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 Um, I did say backup. We want everyone to back up their files once a week. It's one way to avoid a digital disaster. Good idea, you gotta back it up if you don't want to lose it. If you don't back up often, you risk losing it all if your computer crashes, gets hacked, or downloads a virus. You could lose it all. It's fast and easy to back up to an external hard drive, a DVD or CD, a flash drive, or to cloud storage. And when you're finished backing up your files, disconnect your backup drive until you use it again. You gotta back it up, back it up. If you want it, so I couldn't have said it better myself. Back it up. Visit onguardonline.gov to learn more. Okay, that was fun. Um, that was from the Federal Trade Commission, which actually has a lot of information on scams and um, other, like, all kinds of really great information. I encourage you to take a look. Um, I, I, I don't back up that often. <laughs> <laughs> Even having had ransomware, you know, if you if you if it works for you to do it once a week, I think that's great. If you're not creating new content or writing uh, new things or downloading uh, photos from your phone that frequently, you know, find a schedule that works for you. And the other thing to think about when talking about backing up your systems is that the best practice is to have two different backups in two different formats. Um, so for example, we have all of our digitized photos um, in the Burt Kellogg collection. We have, we still have the negatives, physical negatives here in the library. And we have the scanned images, one on a physical hard drive here in the library, and two copies of those same digital files on computers in Olympia. And the reason for that is if there's an earthquake and Fort Angeles falls into the ocean, the, the copies in Olympia will still be there. So um, recommending things like, you know, back up to your flash drive and then every whatever, once a quarter, back your flash drive up to the cloud or back it up to a DVD once a month and once a year, send your most recent DVD to a family member out of state. You know, that way, if there's a house fire, you know, if you keep three copies of flash drives, but they're all in your house and you have a house fire, you now have nothing. So keeping something um, 
either in the cloud, which theoretically should be safer from these, or in a physical off-site location. Um, and you're going to have to figure out for yourself the balance of that. You know, if you keep one in your house and one at your safe deposit box that's in town, is that far enough away? It needs to be close enough that you can do it regularly, more than twice a year, so that it's actually up to date. But it should be far enough away that, you know, if if your house is on a floodplain and you gave your flash drive copy to your neighbor who's on the same floodplain, that's not great odds. Um, so you, you do have to find that balance of what's useful, but also doable. Um, we are in general going to um, also try to make um, passwords secure um, as a, a basic step um, in keeping our information safe online. So we do not include personal information in a password. It's not um, our name followed by our birth year. It's not the name of the street we live on. Oh, it's not our dog's birthday. It is not, um, it's best if it's not a real word, um, but we do, not, we do not include our personal information when making a password. Um, some recommendations are to use a passphrase, um, which is two or more words. And I find these easier to remember, um, but uh, you know, you can make a passphrase that works for you. There are resources online where we can test a password. Um, we're gonna make sure that it is you know, recommended by the FBI or the FTC. We're not gonna just use any, we're not gonna Google secure password tester, but we can find a secure password tester. And then it'll tell you how long it would take current technology to brute force decrypt your password. Um, I tested one of my passwords yesterday and it, like it was an amount of time I couldn't even imagine. Um, it's like millions of years for, for it to be um, just the computer to try every single possibility. You can consider using a password manager, and there are some recommendations um, on products like this. I don't personally use one, but my spouse does. Um, the thing about password managers is that you, you only have to remember one password. You remember the password manager password, and it keeps all of your other passwords, which it generates it will generate a secure password for you for each site that's different and then manages it for you. Because we do not want us to, to allow our browsers or phones to store our passwords, our usernames or our credit card information. For, like my credit card information is stored sometimes on my phone. Like it, it's a balance, right? Like, um, but you know, you wanna uh, eliminate that or decrease that as much as possible. And the password manager will help you do that. Um, so even though allowing the browser and the, you know, the apps or whatever to store your password and credit card information is convenient to balance it with um, what the possible threat is. Um, and we are also going to want to keep our operating systems, our filters, and any antivirus software we have up to date. I will, it looks like there's a couple questions, so I will look through the chat, um, and then we have a couple of examples that we can do as a group. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Let me go back up here. Most of it's about my being muffled, I apologize. Um, Marjorie says, it's also true that unreliable websites such as Breitbart have a number of interrelated websites that support what they say. Yeah, that like that's part of having to you know separate, go to another source, and trying to make sure that there's you know not an umbrella corporation or a parent company or like people that are in on it together, kind of. Um, and then. Um, somebody asked, how safe are password managers? How difficult to hack? Um, I, like I said, I don't have one, but um, the library does offer them to staff for all 50 million passwords that we need to have for everything. Um, so if you are interested, I'm sure we could ask IT which, which um, password manager we have um, that we use here internally. Um, I think that there's probably a variety of, you know, like you're going to get what you pay for. Um, but we can definitely find that out for you. 
if there are any other questions, please just go ahead and ask. Um, and then if there's none, we will go to our, our examples. Have, you can still jump in if you have questions, but we'll go ahead with our examples. So I have here some screenshots um, and captures of various scams or things that you might be concerned about. So um, I, idea, my idea is that we would just look at these as a group and you can either suggest what you notice that, that would make you question it, what steps you would take, what step you would start with, um, or something like that. So it's very open just to like help you apply all of these tools. So here is our first example. So um, please uh, just go ahead and you can just do it verbally. What are things that you notice? What would you do first? Well, I would say, is it actually from PayPal? It looks like it is because of the, they've got the logo and all that that looks like it. And I get these all the time. Yeah, and I, I don't, yeah. And then the other one is it's from Gmail. Yeah. I think that that's the big one is that it's from Gmail. Why would a PayPal help center be sending from a personal, Visa dot whatever that that is very suspicious. I don't have PayPal, so like the fewer accounts you have, the easier it is to spot the scams. When I don't have that account, uh, makes it easy. Um, so what what would you do if you open this? You saw it from Gmail. So what are we going to do or not do? Well, you're going to delete it. <laughs> yeah, and that's fine. If, that, if that's what you do, that is, you didn't click on it, you didn't open it, you didn't use the Authenticate Now, and you didn't put your password in anywhere. Great. If you wanted to take the extra step and find out how do I forward this to PayPal so they know it's a problem, that's great too. Okay. Okay. Right. A second, this is, this is a grandkid scam. Your grandson was arrested last night in Mexico. This is a text message that came to your phone, theoretically. I don't have a grandson, so I would delete it. <laughs> Yay. Um, I, I've never had to bail anybody out of jail, but that seems like a lot of money. Um, and I think that this is one that um, we, we might look to see online. Is this one we should report to the sheriff or the FBI? Um, like you, you don't have to. You delete it. You don't click on anything. Maybe you mention it to some of your friends so they, they know not to click on it. You know, that's great. Um, if you want to go the extra step of finding out how to report things like this, then again, that helps these law enforcement agencies kind of see the picture, the frequency, the area, our, you know, our um, 360 cell phones being targeted this month. Is it phones that end in this number or they're T-Mobile or like where, where was the breach that allowed this to get started? Um, so that, I think that's helpful. But um, again, it's not necessary. It's, it's not your responsibility necessarily. We, we can't fix these. So here's an email, it's kind of wordy. Um, I'll let you read the first paragraph. Evelyn said she got this one. I've gotten this one at work. Um, and 
they can like spoof your email so it looks like it's coming from yourself or from a colleague when it's not. Um, I, it, you know, when I opened, this isn't the exact one, but I got one just like this at work. And when I opened it, I did have a moment of panic because it's, you know, it's a sensitive topic. It's going to be a threat to my job. Like I'm going to get, I'm going to get fired. Um, but I, you know, I knew it was a scam because I do not look at pornography on my work computer. So, you know, very, very obvious, not a thing that exists. Um, yeah. Um, thanks, Evelyn. Um, you know, and, and there's just enough in this email that's that could be accurate, right? We know that spyware is a thing that exists. Our email address has been spoofed. Like these, what other technology, it, you know, could be included here? Um, they say they will get a notification when the email is opened. I'm sure we've all had um, like an email read receipt that has been requested before. So like that's a thing that exists. It, it increases the feeling that this could be credible, um, but it is not. Okay, um, but it is really um, emphasizing that panic emotion and trying to get you to do something, you know, before anybody else finds out. So, you know, stop, take a breath. It's hard to do. Here's one couple more. So this would be like a pop-up um, in a browser or on your phone. I've had this one happen to me. It's really scary because it's not just that, it's pop-ups all over your screen. Yeah. Well, and even this by itself, there's there's yellow, there's exclamation marks. It's very like the feeling of urgency is built into like how this all the pieces of this are are in here. Um, so we, we don't want it, we don't want to use the remove viruses button at the bottom. Um, we would and then there was yeah. there was ringing bells and beeps oh, yeah. and buzzes and air. I mean, Washing, then you had right? the phone, uh -huh. phone number and oh my lord, it was awful. Yes, definitely do not call that phone number. I did that right. myself. I um I self-inflicted my um <laughs> my poor laptop with uh bad things and I had to take it over to custom computer and get it fixed. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've shared a couple that I've experienced with. Like these happen to, to us, and it's not because we did something wrong or you know, not because we don't understand scams exist. It's just like we all have these shortcuts. They get us through the day and one of them is I'm on a trusted site or I'm in an email from says it's from somebody I trust and I'm just going to you know kind of go through motions and I open something before I notice what it is or you know whatever like these these are things that happen unfortunately so we're just really trying to decrease the frequency and the severity to which they happen to us but I have a question about yeah. this particular one because it just showed up all over my screen and I was just kind of innocently going along. I don't think I got an email. I don't know what it was. So how do you get rid of it without calling the number or you know whatever? You turn off your computer or turn it totally off and turn it back on again to reboot your computer or what do you do? Yeah, I mean, it kind of depends on what you're in, what's open when you start. But um, if you're on a Windows computer, I think Alt F4 will close a window, you know, so it's like I've, I've been, um, I've had these pop-ups where there is no X, I can't find an X to close it. So you right. like escape, Alt F4, Control, Alt Delete, let's see if we can close it. And then um, theoretically you would run your virus uh, protection, you would run your antivirus program just to make sure you can, you can restart your computer. Um, Cindy says she closes down her computer, leaves it off for 10 minutes and then open back up. Like that, that seems reasonable. Um, we would wanna make sure that there's nothing that's been downloaded during this process, just as a, we don't want key loggers or spyware or anything on there. Um, but in general, like if it's just, if it's just a pop-up that is scary and trying to get you to click, and it's not actually doing anything until you click that button, then, then you probably just need to close it and maybe try to figure out what we were doing that brought it up. Was it maybe a questionable website? Did we like, you know, Marjorie said she didn't open it. She didn't open an attachment. Like that's 
it may, may have been a website or something else. So, you know, um, this level of spyware isn't my specialty, um, but we could have IT come and do a whole session for you. Yeah, my, my particular one was um, I was I was looking up some uh, knitting a crochet pattern or something like that on a on a website that has a lot of ads on it. Yeah. And I uh -huh. clicked on the wrong one. Right. Yep. Yeah, I think that uh, when we were saying earlier, the, the position of ads is um, tells you about the website. And I have been to a few sites where it loads the page long enough for you to try to click on something and then it loads the ad real quick so then the page drops down and you click on the ad i think that's so shady it drives me nuts um but you know if it's a site that you you're using for something else and you know that it does that then you'll just build in that i'm gonna wait for the ad i'm gonna you know i'm gonna wait for it to load so you don't accidentally do it um so yeah things like that being aware that i think that's super annoying Okay, this is another email example. And what do you notice? What would you do? There's a one in Outlook. It's not an L. Yeah, service.outlook.com. And also the MS Outlook 94. What's 94? Like it, it, if it's going to be a uh -huh. representative, it's going to be, you know, a person's name, like our email address is at the library, our first initial last name, or it might be from like help desk, right, at, at Yahoo or at Outlook. This doesn't look like a legitimate sender. Um, and in general, when we get, you know, sometimes your passwords expire, sometimes there are data breaches and a company will have to send out and say, hey, you know, we got hacked, please come in and reset your password. We're not going to do it from the email. We're going to go to our Outlook account in a different browser. We're going to open it up, and then we're going to see, you know, if there's a message there, or if we're just going to reset the password there. But we're not going to use these links. Yeah. Okay. We got one more. I think one more. So this is another text message that you would get. Well, you'll, you'll, you'll never, you'll never get a text message from the IRS. <laughs> and I know that social security or from Medicare or any of those. I think and I don't a scam, there was a scam a couple, just a couple years ago, like two or three years ago where people were getting like calls or texts that there were like a, here in the county, there was a warrant out and they needed to like pay, you know, to the um, the sheriff or something like through text message, the sheriff is not gonna text you that you have a warrant you've never heard about and demand a gift card. Um, but, you know, but that was the thing that was happening, I think here in the county within the last couple of years that I recall. Um, Jay Louie, I think you had think. Sorry, you were going to say something as well. I don't think the IRS is going to tell you to accept a refund, nor that you only have 24 hours to do so either. That doesn't even pass credibility. The 24 hours is again trying, I think that that's trying to add to that. This is this is important. I have a very limited time, like trying to get you to hurry up and make a decision rather than take a break and look at it. Yeah. And uh, we always send stuff out. Um, the library has a website, part of our website that we put up during tax season every year. And there will be information on, you know, the IRS doesn't text you, the IRS doesn't call you, you know, the IRS will send you a, a piece of mail and it will look like this. And this is how the IRS communicates with people, not these other ways. Um, and so I think that that yeah, you know, and it's just like we don't, we've never worked for the IRS. I don't know how the IRS operates. Maybe they add it, you know. I think it's not unreasonable for people to assume technology is everywhere. Sure, the IRS might text me because it's so convenient. Why not? Um, but it's a government office and they don't move fast. I think that was our last example. So we have about 10 minutes. So I'm happy to take questions or um, if, you, if we just want to chat, I'm happy to help with that. 
um, after uh, this session, I will save the slides as a PDF um, in case you want to look at them. You will see a lot of these had um, source notes for where I got these images, especially. Those are not all reflected on the um, resources page because I just used it for one, one photo, one example. Um, so I will send them out separately or I'll have screen send them out. Um, but the citations and resources page, it has some of the videos that we watched and other articles that you could read or resources that you could look at to, um, to read further on this topic. Any other questions or comments or internet scam war stories? Very helpful information. And I have to say, I was a college professor and I have to say that um, it was uh, very difficult to convince students that the sources that they were citing were not reliable. So if you're writing a paper about cerebral palsy, you're not going to be quoting some source from a law office because why are why are they doing why would they have any information about that particular topic? It's because you know <laughs> Um, since we have some time, I'll be happy to show the online resources for the library's website. Let me see share. So starting from our homepage, um, we can just go to this online resources tab, and that's going to open up some navigation options for us. We have topics grouped up here on the top. So if I'm looking for uh, something, I want to check um, um, something that my doctor said, or I saw a commercial on TV for a medication that I, you know, maybe I want to ask about. I can go to the health and wellness tab, or we can just scroll through. Um, each of these sections with the green heading, you will first see the databases for which the library pays. Um, so these are databases that we have. Um, we've examined, we believe that their information um, is on the credible side and that it is helpful and from a legitimate source. And um, at the bottom of each, you will see a more button. And if you click on the more, it will load the, um, the database, the paid databases again. And then at the bottom, some related free websites. And the library has, library staff have looked at these and consider that they are useful, um, but the, they are free to use. So you are going to, you know, there's going to be ads and you're going to have to take them maybe with a little, just a little grain of salt, um, but they are available there for you. All of the databases that um, are linked that we pay for, you can use in the library and you can also use them all currently from home. You just have to enter your library card now. So one, um, great resource, especially when we're talking about um, news, breaking news, comparing news, um, is going to be in the news and research. We have the Yale database package. So if we click on this, it gives us different modules, but I like to go to the newspapers. And so I'm now able to search um, thousands of newspapers that are in Gale. They, there are some going back historically, but um, I personally mostly use this for current news for things you know from relatively recently. Um, you can get today's news. Um, there's no embargo period. You can open content that got published today. Um, and really the only caveat with this is it's newspapers. So if the news reporter is biased, it's, it's in here. Like Gail is not weeding out um, things that are, you know, they're not fact checking, they're not comparing. But if you wanted to look at um, any topic, 
I don't know what the, I'm trying to think of something that's, that's not sad, scary, that's news um, that we would want to look for. Um, Idaho has been in the news a lot. We'll look for Idaho. So I have thousands, how many, thousands of, of news uh, articles that come up for my keyword search. I can uh, sort them. Maybe I, I want to see today's news first. So here they are. This is from Vancouver, BC. This one's from the Belfast Telegraph. This is from CNN Wire. And all of these, I should be able to open and read the full text. Most of these aren't going to have any photos if there was a photo included, but I do have the full text of the article. I can read the entire thing. I can save it. I can email it. I can print it. So if I were looking for news on a breaking topic or I wanted to compare um, news from different sources, I could do, I can use Gale to view newspaper articles from different publishers. Um, and there's one other site that I think is really useful when talking about um, news. Um, actually, there's, there's two. I'm going to show two. Um, so factcheck.org. Um, you can look at news topics and they give a um, they give fact, factual information, how honest it was. Um, so let's see here. But so when we're um, when we're looking at a website, um, we always want to look for an about us. We want to see who's working there. This one has a mission, a process, the funding. This like these are great things to have. Um, a lot of times we'll just get like maybe contact information and not a lot else. We don't know where the money's coming from. That's a little squeaky. Um, and if there's no about us, that's I consider that a pretty big red flag. But they've got how to contact, awards, all this. So like we could definitely explore that and, and decide if we thought, you know, this is maybe, oh, you know, this aligns with what we're looking for. Um, so we're gonna go to the science page and it's got, it's basically debunking news that has um, been erroneously reported and giving actual facts. So we can use this. And then there's another site that I have used, which is called allsides.com. And this, um, this is more user driven in that you can go to the site and you can say, um, where? So they have this chart here. Um, and so you can go and say, you know, I read, I don't know, what do I read? I was reading uh, Yahoo News and I felt that, you know, I read six articles and they all seemed really, I considered them left wing or they seemed really right, aggressively right wing. So you can say, you know, it aggregates how, where people feel this falls. And so it's kind of a place for you to start. You're like somebody shared an article with me. It was from a news outlet I've never heard before. This chart says that most people feel like it is right wing or left wing or, you know, whatever. It's in the center. So that is another kind of place to start when you're looking for it. Like, what am I look? What what am I looking for? What am I looking out for as I review this article? And how do other people consider it? So I think that that is a useful um, tool, especially if you find a news article and you're like, "Wow, this seems really one-sided." I want to make sure I get the other side. I can look at this chart for whatever is in two columns over, and then look for the same story from that perspective. So that can be useful. Um, I think I was looking for examples yesterday on Snopes. This is just fun to look at sometimes. Um, but it is another like fact checker. They've got, um, I think this is the one, they've got a scale where um, somebody has made a claim and it's, you know, most true, mostly true, kind of in the middle or pants on fire. Um, and it'll give you um, like the source for why that's, Pants on fire. Okay. If there's any other questions, we got just like two minutes left. I'm happy to take any. Or if there's some something that you wish we would talk about next year.
Well, thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Sarah. As always, every time I listen to you talk, I learn something new, and I'm so excited to know about that media bias chart that oh, yeah. is all new to me. So thank you. You're welcome. And thank you so much for joining us. And as I mentioned earlier, I'll send all of you an email containing links and details for all the good stuff today. And we have a really long list of, of recommendations from Sarah. So you can look forward to that. I'm going to share my screen for just a couple more minutes. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay. Hopefully you can all see um, next month. We'll be meeting on December 20th at 11 a.m. here in our Zoom room. And for our final 2022 gathering, we'll be exploring the neuroscience behind memory, particularly the concepts presented in this book. Remember, The Science of Memory and the Art of Forgetting, written by Lisa Genova. Genova is a neuroscientist and acclaimed author. She wrote the novel Still Alice about a woman suffering from early onset Alzheimer's. And in this book, in Remember, she explains how memories are made and how we retrieve them. So our brains aren't designed to remember every single thing that enters them. And just because our memory sometimes fails does not mean that it's broken. We don't need to panic. So this book describes the factors that influence the creation of a memory, which helps us understand the language of memory and how it functions, which can help us improve our ability to remember and help us feel a little less rattled when we forget. So I found this to be really interesting and a bit lighter than our last book. Basically, there's no discussion of human composting in this one. So... <laughs> And um, as usual, print copies of the book will be available at the Port Angeles and Squim libraries. I am happy to send copies to the West End for anyone who would like a print copy. Just send me an email to request a book. And also, if you would like to borrow this title in an ebook or e audiobook format, you can go to our catalog at knowles.org or go into your Libby app and search Remember Genova, and you'll find it there. And as always, everyone's welcome to join next month in the discussion whether or not you have read the book. So that is it for today. Before we go, I want to thank Sarah again for all the fantastic information. Yay! And thank all of you for being here with us today. And I would like to thank the Knowles friends of the library organizations across the county who helped make all this possible. So everyone be safe, be well, and we will see each other in December. Bye-bye. Thank you.